All right, welcome back to another episode of the TFD Performance Podcast. We have a returning guest. We have Nina Gelpke joining us again. Nina, thanks so much for coming on. Hi, it's great to be here. Now, everyone watching the YouTube would see that it looks like Nina's just got into a In fight the last couple of weeks. Nina, what's going on? Yeah, so I had my wisdom teeth removed, all four of them. Um, and yeah, this is actually the best it's been in the last week. It was so or- horrible. Like every time I looked in the mirror, I just freaked myself out because it's how swollen and bruised I was. So this is actually looking good. Me and Nina were talking off air. And when I was back at university in my first couple of years of uni, I worked as a theatre orderly. And one of the theatres we looked after was a uh, wisdom teeth theatre. And I was saying to Nina that, people like don't realize how rough the surgeons are when you're out under general anesthetic. And you can see why, once you've seen it, why people get so bruised, especially because what happened a lot of the time is like when they were trying to pull out or clamp down on the wisdom teeth, they'd break and shatter and then they'd have to go through and like get it. Yeah. And I was saying that what I, when I had it done back when I was like 19 or something, I was lucky enough to stay awake. It sounds very sadistic, but I was lucky enough to stay awake and get local and just rip it out. And it it was bad for like two, three days. And then I feel like I got over it. Mm -hmm. It just must be because they're so rough when you're under general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mine hadn't come through yet. So like, what have they had to do to get them out? They were growing like this. So just probably wasn't a good time for the surgeons. (laughs) Better out than in, I suppose. eh? Yeah. Yeah. And you only have to do it once in your life. So at least there's that. All right, well, let's get to it. Today, we're going to be doing a little bit of myth busting. Not a little bit of myth busting. We've got a few good ones. I put it out on our Instagram and I've kind of picked, I'd say probably, how many we got here? Like three, six, nine, 10-ish, probably 10 of the best questions that I thought would be really good to go through. And these are ones that I'm sure, Nina, both you and I get all the time. And I really want to get your thoughts on it and have a bit of a discussion. I think we just jump right into it. What do you think? Great, sounds good. First one, this is a good one for you. This is a good one for you being a... uh, CrossFit officiander. Is that the word officiander? Is that, is that, is that how you say it? I don't think I've heard that word before, to be honest. I, I, you know what? I, I think it's a word, but I completely butchered it. A CrossFit well, it enthusiast. My language, so I'm going to excuse myself from that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I have zero excuse because it's my <laughs> first language and I don't speak any other language. But let's talk about this one. This will be a good one. Fasted cardio burns more fat. True or false, Nina Gelke? So it is false in terms of like burning more fat weight loss burning more fat like are you metabolizing more fat when you haven't eating eaten carbs just before yeah you probably are going to be metabolizing more fats when you do that workout but that doesn't then result in more fat loss because overall throughout the day it still comes down to your energy balance so your energy intake compared to your energy expenditure and just because you've trained faster doesn't mean that that's going to be greater it still comes down to how much you're eating versus how much you're burning throughout the day So if you have someone and they go, you know what, Nina, like I I trained faster this morning, but I'm going to go do it. I'm still sticking to my diet. It really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. And actually quite the opposite, because if you're fueling your training better, chances are you're probably going to expend more energy during that session. So you might actually be, be better off and you probably feel better having something to eat. Plus it also helps regulate regulate appetite so you don't you know train faster but then later on in the day you're starving because you put yourself into this big kind of energy deficit during the day yeah i know there are some good studies that look at if people do fasted cardio and the rates of overeating later in the day Mm. they have found that yeah if you just exercise in general you're going to be hungrier but if you do that and then you do say it's fast until lunchtime there is much better chance you're just going to be loading up on those calories later in the day and you'll tip out of that deficit or maintenance and you might even tip into the surplus so. <laughs> exactly yep so i'm not a fan of fast cardio um like of course if if someone wants to do that and they just prefer that then okay sure go do that but you know we do know especially if you're doing anything high intensity like your crossfit or your f45 or your hit or anything like that that you're definitely going to most likely benefit from having a bit of a carb rich snack before your training and, and just perform better that's a good point too, Hayes, because a lot of people wake up in the morning and they go to say, I don't know, F45 or even a CrossFit workout and they're intense. They are intense. Like, you, yeah, you spend a bit of time warming up, but you get that all the time, right? Where people are like, you know what? I just, I can't do it. I can't eat in the morning. I can't do that. But then they go and just slaughter themselves. How important is it that they do actually get something if they're doing one of those high intensity sessions? 
Well, the thing is we can't metabolize fats fast enough in order to hit those high intensities. Like it's a glycolytic sport. We need to have those carbohydrates on board in order to really perform at our best. So, you know, most people who are training in that way, performance is a priority for them. So if they're not eating, it's kind of like, okay, well, you're putting all this effort into training and you're missing one of the big puzzle pieces that would give you a big advantage, you know, just having a bit of extra fuel on board. So, you know, and you don't have to go and eat a three course breakfast. You could go have, you know, uh, a couple of dates, half a banana, a glass of fruit juice, like something small that's not going to sit heavy in your stomach. Even that's better than nothing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, uh, I'll flip on the other side of the coin and I'll say we are saying that you shouldn't do it. There are some sports where it can be favorable. If you're doing like endurance sports, you do. And it's pretty common with a lot of teams where they'll target these low intensity. And I'll say that again, yeah, low intensity low sessions, sessions where, sure. where you're not getting that heart rate up and you can get some, well, it, theoretically you can get some favorable adaptations for mitochondrial biogenesis. And mm -hmm. we do that. We do that with a lot of our training, but again, that's like one, maybe two sessions a week of one of your yep. slow, easy runs that you'll do. And it's part of a periodized training plan. Exactly. You would never, ever, ever be able to adapt adequately, even to an endurance training program. If you did that every single training Doing it session. every day. Yeah. And yeah, someone who's training CrossFit, you know, three, four, five times a week training fasted, it's just not doing you any favors, especially females as well with hormones like we do see that very common, even, you know, with people eating enough throughout the day, just doing that faster training can throw hormones off and lead to irregular periods or even missing periods if you're not fueling that training properly. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say on this before we move on is that there's a really cool article that Sigma Nutrition did out, put out, but maybe I think like 2015 or 2016 or something like that. There's two of them, and I encourage everyone listening to go read this. There's one called Eat More Fat, Burn More Fat, Myth, Magic, or Metabolic Something, Something. I can't remember. Go and read that, and it goes over all of this, the nuances of what actually happens in fat balance in your body throughout the day. So maybe you do wake up in the morning, you do fast cardio, and you do burn more fat. Does that lead to more fat loss or weight loss? No. And Danny and his team explains this in really, really, really high depth. Go and read that article. But I think, Nina, anything else you want to add to that, or we covered that one? I think we busted that one. I think busted, boom, put that to the side. That one is busted. Let's run with the, with the body fat and the fat in particular. This is one that we get, oh, I get this all the time, actually. I, I have had, you know what? I've had this conversation probably five times this week, I think. Mm -hmm. Nina Gelke, you can spot reduce fat in your body, true or false? That is false. And I know we all wish it were true. I know we all oh, do. Don't we? <laughs> don't we? Can I just, you know on the abs or whatever like it's so common but you know it's just like you know you can't spot gain weight somewhere you can't you know say okay I'm gonna eat this burger and I want it to go to my butt or to my quads or whatever you know we all wish you know something like that would be possible but the same thing happens with with fat reduction you know of course like if you target um, like muscle groups and certain exercises, you're going to help build muscle in those areas. So maybe that would help with like body composition if you're targeting certain muscle groups, but definitely not dieting or exercising in a certain way is going to mean that you lose fat in that area. And, you know, the, the thing that dictates that is very much largely genetics. Some people lose fat and hold fat easier in some areas of their body and some people in other areas, you know, whether that's kind of abdominal region or legs or butt region, like that's very much genetic. Yeah. I think when you work with enough athletes, eh, especially with what I do, where we do a lot of weight making, right? Body composition is a big part of that. You see just how crazy the genetic spread is. Like I've got yeah. some athletes that they just physically, well, they can, you know what, if we, if we went full, you know, threw them in a desert, didn't give them any food, they probably would get lower, but it just in normal everyday life, they won't get down, say lower guys won't get lower than 14% body fat mm. or guys that get to 12% body fat. And they just don't have abs that you can see, but they're quite yeah. lean and they just don't have the muscular tone. And it's a genetic thing. And then like, I've looked at pictures of this one particular athlete I'm talking about of his father when he was an athlete back exact same thing he was never super shredded when he was quite lean and quite active so it is a largely genetic thing and i think people kind of get this unicorn and they want to chase it and like you see him yeah. doing like crunches in the gym and doing all these weird workouts and high knees running and i don't know i'm not i'm not bagging it i'm not saying they're bad exercises but they're probably not going to get you as shredded as what you think you are 
yeah yeah body composition you know we can do a lot but a lot of it does come down to genetics in the end and spot reducing fat definitely not a thing yeah yeah i think uh i think that's pretty good i don't think we have to add too much on that if you want to get that i think your best bet really is like you've heard this a million times right look after your diet look after your exercise, look after your lifestyle, look after your mental health. That's a big thing that's going to play in a big role of this. Mm -hmm. Stress does play a big role, you know, in, in, in how we manage our body composition. But Nina, what do you think? Busted or not? Definitely busted. Da, definitely busted. Now this one, this one's good. I want to ask you this because out of all people, you're going to have a good answer for this one. All right. Are all carbs created equal? True or false? Definitely not. So in, in like so many different ways, like that we could look at this, we could look at it from a health perspective, you know, some carbs, especially those whole food carb sources, you know, the ones that are coming from your whole grains, your starchy veggies, your fruits, your legumes, they're going to be more health promoting because they are more nutrient dense. They've got lots of dietary fiber. They've got lots of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytonutrients, whatnot, compared to, you know, your very refined carbs, which are kind of, they don't really provide much other than just the carbohydrates, which might have their place in terms of like fueling exercise and, and that kind of thing, but they don't really provide much in terms of health benefits but then we could also look at it in terms of how they're absorbed so you know simple carbs they're already in their simple form so they're more from um like single and disaccharide so they're absorbed a lot blood sugar response when you eat different types of carbs the simple carbs are absorbed much faster versus your complex which are your long chain carbohydrates such as yeah the whole grains the starchy vegetables they take a lot longer to break down into those sugars so that means it has a slower effect on blood sugar and energy levels to keep you going a little bit longer keep you fuller a little bit longer so yeah there's lots of ways we can look at it but they're definitely not all created equal that's for sure yeah, absolutely. And I, and I love that having that conversation with clients, right? When you break down the chemistry of it, right? Because I think it is, it is a bit of a misconception, I find. And I want to hear your two cents of this. And I think it's a bit more prevalent in like the fitness bodybuilding world, maybe like the whole, like if it fits your macros type mm. thing. Like I find that a lot. I remember I had a client once that I knew he had like quite bad eating, you know, disordered eating tendencies yeah. and his relationship with food was not great. So I didn't want to do any calories or anything with him. And he ended up figuring it out. And he ended up, I don't know why he did this, but he decided he wanted to eat all his daily calories and Krispy Kremes and like a can of Coke to prove that you could still oh. lose weight. All right. And, and I remember like he told me this and he, you know what, he did lose weight. And he's like, I told you like, it's all this, if it fits mm. your macros. And I was like, man, like if you do that for months on end and you're just eating like Krispy Kremes and Coca-Cola, and you're, you're not getting any of this fiber. You're not getting any of the nutrients, micronutrients, phytonutrients. You will feel garbage. Like all carbs are not created equal. And it just yeah. blew my mind. Yeah. Even just coming back to the fact that yes, like, macronutrients carbs proteins fats provide us with energy but like those energy pathways they rely on micronutrients like you know your zinc and your b vitamins and your magnesium and your iron they're actually required in order to metabolize those macronutrients into energy so if we're just eating you know the macronutrients without the mac micronutrients and we have deficiencies in those micronutrients we might not even be able to really properly metabolize them into energy and have all those physiological processes in our bodies working properly just because we're missing on those micronutrients i think this has turned into more of a if it fits your macros <laughs> is it true or false and i think it's definitely <laughs> totally. def definitely busted that one but no all carbs are not created equal i think that one's busted. definitely busted let's throw that one to the curb this is a good one we're just talking about this off air and i'm actually really interested to hear your thoughts on this one mm -hmm. Arti artificial sweeteners are bad for you true or false flat out bad for you. I don't think we can really say that about anything. And yeah, artificial sweeteners, look, are they super healthy? I don't know. We don't really know that. I don't think we're from the research. We could even say that just yet, but are they bad for us? Like they're tested to be safe in the levels that we eat them. You know, all of the testing that uh, artificial sweeteners have undergone like they're in doses way way higher than we would ever consume on a regular basis if you're having like a diet coke a day or you're having like a protein powder with some kind of sweetener in there so in that regard are they safe in terms of are they gonna not cause any health issues yes absolutely they're fine and you know if if we compare them to the 
alternative, like for example, a diet soda versus drinking just a regular soda, it's probably going to be better for your health than having all of that excess sugar that we probably don't need. So, you know, we can look at it from that perspective. Um, the only thing that I would potentially be cautious of is the possibility of gut upset if you have too much of these kinds of products, which is, you know, more common in some people than others, you know, people with sensitive stomachs, especially those more prone to IBS symptoms, they might be more sensitive to those artificial sweeteners, especially certain types. Um, so, you know, if you find that you don't react that well in terms of digestion for artificial sweeteners or certain ones, then that might just be something to look out for. But again, that that's just discomfort rather than it actually being bad for you. So I think there's always important to differentiate between those two facts, like just because something causes gut symptoms, of course, it means it's not great, but that doesn't mean it's actually doing damage to your health. It's just, it, it's causing very unpleasant symptoms, which is a signal that you should probably dial back on that a little bit. Yeah, that's what I always say when I have this conversation about artificial sweetness. So that's a big one, at least with uh, our athletes. And I find, especially with like, a lot of what we do say so with the training or the rehydration after we're making weight, things like that, that gut, that gut issue does seem to happen a lot. And I've had that in guys in the past where, you know, they're dieting to make weight or whatever. And they're going just to get past the appetite, like to curb that appetite. They're having four, five, six Coke zeros a day or whatever, which yeah. isn't, you know, too bad or anything. It's not like they're adding up the calories, not adding up the sugar, but then yeah. they're going, you know what, like I'm getting these like stomach aches and mid training, this is happening and I'm not feeling too good. So it's like, well, you know what? Like, yeah, in one sense, it, they're, they're pretty good and like they're doing this. But if you are that person that's going to respond that way and you're getting these IBS symptoms, then yeah, obviously we need to dial it back. Definitely. Yep. All right. So I think we've well and truly busted that one. Stop giving artificial sweetness such a high hard time. I think that's a good point to make as well. The super physiological doses. Don't quote me on this, but isn't it the... The, like the rat study that they did it was like 1500 times what you would ever have in like it's a, a crazy diet amount. Coke or they're, something. they're so high amounts and like you know if you're having a lot of artificial sweeteners in your diet like i'd be questioning your diet quality anyway because if we look at where those sweeteners are found it's usually in highly processed foods so having a little bit here and there especially you know if it's something that you enjoy or maybe if you're in a dieting phase and it helps you with managing appetite then sure you know they have their place but it shouldn't be something that every single meal has lots of you know these diet products and artificial sweeteners because it probably means you're missing out on the more nutritious foods yeah, also a very good point. So artificial sweeteners, boom, you've been busted. Take a seat on the bench. All right, next one. This is going to be a good one. I keep saying all these are going to be. I feel like my <laughs> audience has just curated this for you, which we they have, I guess. So I you can it. achieve a healthy diet without eating vegetables. True or false? That is false. <laughs> I felt I a bit nervous asking you that too. I don't know why. I felt a little nervous. I wasn't sure what your response was going to be. Look, I, I just I just don't see it. I just I feel like I can't even say anything more than just no. Yeah, I, I the reason I want to ask is because I we spoke about this on the podcast I was on the other day and same thing. I kind of sat there and I was like, where where is this going? And <laughs> And of course, this like led into a discussion about like carnival diet and mm. liver king and all of that. And I was like kind of sitting there and hearing it out. And I was thinking, man, like maybe like, you know what, maybe in theory, maybe in theory, you could just eat like animal products and get all of that. And I just think, but how realistic and sustainable would that be? Like, even if you could no. do it, like, I just mm. don't see someone I, doing I don't that long term. I really don't see it. And like, if, if we think about like what all nutrition professionals across the world agree on it's that vegetables are good for us and you know if we look at gut health if we look at prevention of chronic disease if we look at just meeting our micronutrient needs like I just don't see it being possible maybe being possible but I just don't see it being realistic to be healthy without vegetables and I also don't see like like why why do we need to be even questioning this like is it that hard to just eat some vegetables yeah I know I know and it's crazy like if you go to the extremes of it, right? Like there's that big thing. I'm, obviously this is in boxing a bit in our realm, but like uh, Canelo Alvarez, who's one of the best boxers of all time, mm -hmm. you know, like the, you, you, I don't know if you know him, but like the best, best, best ever. And he came out that he, um, he just lost a, he went for a light heavyweight title, like to go for fourth division champ. Like it's never been done. And he lost the fight. And then afterwards right. he came out that he was on a vegan diet and people were blaming like the vegan, but then they were like, why'd you do it? And he goes, Oh, I saw the, the Netflix documentary yeah. and did it. And it's like, well, that's a terrible example, right? Because it's like, 
one extreme to the other. Like one, like you shouldn't probably be getting any health advice from any documentary and making decisions on yeah. that type thing. But then like you go in that extreme away, like, and you're not having like this good balanced diet. And if you're doing that, like there's obviously you've got to be hitting all those right marks for your performance yeah, absolutely. and health and everything. You know, you can do any diet poorly. You know, just yeah. because someone's eating vegan doesn't mean that they're meeting all of their nutritional needs, especially as a high level athlete, you know, maybe he wasn't getting enough protein. Maybe he wasn't getting enough carbohydrates. Maybe it was completely other factors not to do with his diet. You know, there's so many variables we have to look at. I think that's the worst thing about statements like this, like people going around and saying like, you can achieve a healthy diet without eating vegetables. It's like, maybe you can't, but like, you shouldn't be saying that. Like mm-hmm. for maybe... of the population, maybe they could, maybe they could find out a way to do it and they do it sustainably. But for the rest of us, I can almost guarantee that it would just be so hard and so unsustainable to do that we shouldn't even like be going around and saying this to people. And honestly, like, how awful would that be like how boring would that be like I can't even fathom not having not being able to eat vegetables like the past week just eating everything pureed and like liquid like it it even just gave me appreciation for like solid vegetables and foods and things that you can like enjoy and you can cook different things like just not having vegetables there it'd be a sad life in my opinion yeah, one thing I discussed um, when this came up on that podcast I was on talking about it is the concept, I don't know if you've heard about this, but um, me and um, Gary Slater from the AIS were talking about it years and years ago about this idea of like the food nutrient network and that yeah. we don't really understand, say if you're going to take just like a, a bunch of vitamins of say like vitamin A and D or whatever, and you're taking them in isolation, does that have the same physiological effect in the extremely complex thing that is human metabolism? As if you do eat it in a vegetable that has all the phytophenols, has, you know, all the micronutrients, it has everything else in there. Totally. Yeah. And I would say definitely not because we have some interesting studies, especially for things like um, the antioxidants, like your vitamin E, for example, that supplementing, it was, I think a study done on some kind of cancer, lung cancer, potentially, and the nutrient, the whole food form, they found it, it reduced the risk of this cancer, but then having the supplement form, it actually increased the risk of this cancer, which is really interesting that, you know, the supplements don't always give the same results as having those nutrients in whole food form. And also like, we know about the micronutrients and the macronutrients and all of that, but there's so many phytochemicals that we still don't yet know about and how these impact our gut health and all of our different, you know, um, health in general, but especially our gut health and the bacteria in our gut, like just not having all of that. I just don't see it being sustainable in the long term. And we also don't have any studies. Like I don't think apart from maybe the Inuits, I think they're the really the only ones. There's no human populations who have gone without eating vegetables and plant matter. So I think it would be a very risky decision. It's funny you say that because um, my partner's sister, her sister went up, she's a nurse and she works like fly in, fly out very remotely Mm -hmm. in Northern Canada in um, Inuit tribes. She goes up and helps all the Inuit communities. And that's the first thing she says when she gets home, get me some vegetables. (laughs) So, so I think we busted that one. I think it's still up for debate. I think we busted it, but I think if you're going to go around and say it, just bite your tongue and stop saying that. So <laughs> this is this is a cool one next one. We did touch on it there, but I want to dive into it a bit more, especially from your angle. Mm-hmm. Athletes can't perform at their peak on a plant-based diet. True or false? It's definitely false. However, it might require a little bit of extra planning, especially if it's, you know, because a plant-based diet generally isn't this what we're used to so it might require a bit of extra planning to ensure that you're replacing everything you were previously eating properly with plant-based alternatives to make sure you're still getting enough and you know plant-based foods tend to be by default lower in energy and lower in protein than the animal-based alternatives so just making sure you're actually eating enough to meet your needs as an athlete is probably one of the biggest sort of obstacles that people face on a plant-based diet is they think, oh yeah, I could just replace this with, you know, vegetables and beans and chickpeas. And then sometimes they fall short. So just well, um, having it well planned, but absolutely can perform your best on a plant-based diet and possibly even have some advantages there in terms of recovery because of all that antioxidants and phytochemicals that you're getting that can help with recovery and reducing the inflammation from training. So there's possibly some evidence there for that. 
Yeah, and I hate to throw anecdata out here, but I remember when I started my ultra endurance training, that was the biggest, single biggest thing I struggled with was like inflammation and recovery. Mm-hmm. And obviously like adaptation and conditioning plays a huge role, but that type of thing really reminded me of, you know what, it's really important to eat these veggies and get a lot of them and eat lots of plants and get these micronutrients because you do feel a difference. And I, that's probably one of the biggest and most consistent conversations I have with athletes is one, probably getting their hydration right. And two, getting a good mix variety of different colorful plants Colors. every yeah. single day in their diet and totally. just how much better their recovery is from doing so. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I think we well and truly gone over that in this question and the last. So athletes can absolutely perform at their peak on a plant-based diet or any diet for that matter, so long as you yeah. do it properly and plan ahead. This is a good one. This is a really good one, actually. This is a good one considering we're coming into winter. Fresh is better than frozen. True or false? This one is actually false. So fresh, like if you think about how fresh produce gets into the supermarket, like a lot of the time it's had a long travel time, then it's possibly been sitting in a warehouse for a while, then it's on the shelves for a while, then you buy it and it's in your fridge for a while. So yeah, it's definitely still nutritious, but along the way it can lose a lot of, especially your water soluble vitamins so your vitamin c is a big one and and some other vitamins can be lost along the way just due to the fact that um, it's been exposed to heat and light and just time so frozen produce because it's usually snap frozen like basically straight after picking it can preserve a little bit more of some of those nutrients so some nutrients are actually higher in your frozen produce as opposed to your fresh just because of that um, like time and transportation and storage variable, but I would probably say they're pretty equal. Yeah. That's one of the things I find with clients when you say that to them, you're like, Oh yeah, like frozen's still pretty good. Like it's a really good option if that's all mm. you can get. And they kind of give you this like squinted eye look and they're like, really? what are you talking about? like, why? But they've been sitting in the freezer for like, it's like, yeah, but like think about where that fruit came from and like mm. how it got to your Woolworths or Coles or out or wherever and like think of the time and how long it's been sitting there like don't get me wrong like food science has come a long way but don't don't discredit the frozen just because they didn't do that whole journey to get you the grocery store definitely yeah all right so frozen just as good as fresh this is a good one actually this is a good one for everyone that likes a bit of late night binging especially on the weeknights <laughs> late night eating is it bad for you? True or false? Look, there's a lot coming out in terms of like eating with your circadian rhythm and it's suggesting that eating during the, the hours where we're awake and where it's, it's sunlight is up uh, is better for us from a metabolic perspective. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad for us to eat late at night. We always have to look at context when asking questions like this. Like, for example, if someone is training late, and they get home and, you know, I don't know, it's nine, 10 o'clock. If they just went to bed and didn't eat. That would be worse for them than if they just had a meal at that late hour of the day. Same thing if they're working late or if they're doing shift work, like not fueling yourself properly just because it's late in the day is definitely going to be worse for you than eating a bit later in the day, even if it might not be optimal. The other thing we have to consider is if we think about late night eating on like a general population sort of perspective, it's usually people sitting in front of the TV and eating like, you know, roasted peanuts and chips and, and chocolates and things like that. So is that good for you? Probably not. So that's probably where the big sort of thing around late night eating is bad for you comes from is the fact that the late night eating is usually just kind of extra sort of snacks on top of our diet that we probably don't really need and they're very energy dense and because we're distracted watching tv we eat very mindlessly and it's easy to overconsume. so i think in that regard like it's definitely something to be mindful of but overall is it bad for us sometimes it's just necessary and that doesn't mean that it's bad for us yeah it's an interesting convo when you get into say like the circadian rhythms right and like the diet yeah. is cool it's definitely cool and i think but like, is it practical you, all the time yeah exactly and then i always think a lot with these things like how much effect does it have or how much weight does it hold compared to your other low-hanging fruit yeah yeah is it like a one percenter sort of thing yeah and I call these things especially when we talk to our athletes about these things it's like are these marginal gains or are they low-hanging fruit where you get like most of your gains from and like how much does eating in time with your circadian rhythms weigh up against say 
your overall caloric intake or your nutrient yeah, timing honestly, around your Honestly, I training. think it kind of is in the realm of that kind of biohacking where you're really getting those like 1% or even less than that kind of thing that may potentially benefit your health, but have you ticked all the basic boxes yet is way more important. Yeah, I have that conversation about so many things when it comes to performance. Like I was talking to someone about this, about ice baths, right? Like about ice baths and like same conversation. Like there's so much different mixed information and this evidence says it's great for recovering from, you know, short distance explosive work. But then this evidence says, don't, it's not good for your resistance training or adaptation to that. People go, oh, should I be doing it for like this many minutes at this temperature? And it's like, for, for what gain? Is it marginal gains or is it most of your gains? And it's like, well, is that going to be more important than say your overall caloric intake for the day? How much protein you're getting? Are you carving up for those sessions? Are you getting your hydration? Are you sleeping properly? Do you have, exactly. Do you have an appropriate training volume that allows you to get that sleep that you're training totally. and adapting to each thing? Are they more important than your ice bath? Maybe, or could you maybe use the ice bath to elicit things such as stress management and Definitely. calming effects and using your breath work, which are probably going to get you. So I think people get really caught up in these little things, these little buzzwords, right? And I think, yeah, maybe they will have marginal gains if you've got the majority of things really, really hammered down. I work with lots of athletes at very, very high levels. And I can tell you not one single one of them have every single one of them hammered down where we would look over here and start using these things. Totally. All right. So that one is well and truly busted. This is a cool one. And I'm actually very interested that to have this chat. Weight loss is all about calories in and calories out. True or false? I think yes, at a core level. However, there's so many factors that influence energy in versus energy out that kind of no because yeah there's just so many factors like you know we can come to things like the fact that how much we eat can affect how much energy we expend so even you know affecting our energy expenditure on that level so for example chronic dieting can lead to people having a reduced metabolic rate it can be you know we can look at things like hyperpalatable food we can look at things like appetite regulation um, and hormones that affect energy balance we can look at food availability we can look at um, socioeconomic status like we can look at all of these different factors which affect energy in versus energy out Um, so yes at a core level but because there's so many things that affect that sort of no yeah I think on a very superficial sense like of course it's right like if you mm. can't break the laws of thermodynamics and that's the laws of thermodynamics right like calories in calories out and especially when you're talking about weight loss but i just think if it was that simple calories in calories out then no one would have any issue adjusting their weight down up or if Absolutely. they want to feel muscle it would be not yep. a problem yeah definitely i think it's just we we always have to look at all of the different factors that affect like how much someone eats someone how much someone even like absorbs from their food how how much someone's appetite is affected by what they eat in their food choices then also um what expects what affects their energy expenditure and how even their energy intake affects their energy expenditure so i think like yes on a basic level but we always have to talk more about it and that's just like the physical things, like everything you just said is just like the physical side of it. And then you look at, okay, well, let's look at the mental side of it. Like Definitely. How you, what your relationship is like with that food, what totally. going on a diet is going to be like, what the psychosocial, like what are your socioeconomic considerations? That's a huge is. one. So like, there's so many things. Like if it was that easy as calories in calories out, why do we struggle with it so much? And even the fact that like calorie tracking in itself, like how accurate is it really? Like, there's always this degree of error that comes with it. Like, you know, when we're reading food labels, like there's a huge margin of error when we're, you know, tracking food. Some people are better than others, but some people have a difficult time even tracking food. There's things like just not being, you know, as aware of all the things that you're consuming outside of what you think you're consuming, you know, absorption, digestion, our gut microbiome might have an effect on how much we absorb from food, how much that food's been processed might have an effect on how much we absorb from food. So there is like just so many factors that actually come into play with that. Yeah, yeah, agreed. So what we're going to say for this one is yes, but like everything in nutrition, there's a lot more to it. (laughs) Exactly. All right. All right. This is a cool one, actually. You'd be a good person to answer this one. 
you can grow muscle in a calorie deficit, true or false? Um, if you're on steroids, then <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, look, it's definitely not optimal. And I don't know, like, are there conditions where it is somehow possible, potentially, maybe you can grow it at maintenance slowly. It's just definitely not optimal. But the, the best and the, the most optimal way to grow muscle is always going to be in a slight cal- caloric surplus. Yeah, and I think that's a good point, right? Like, because it is, it is somewhat possible to do it in a calorie deficit, given you are in the right anabolic environment, mm. which most of the time does not happen if you're just eating pretty well and training pretty hard. You've got to be putting a little bit of something, something in there, a bit of that Mexican go-go juice to, to make <laughs> that happen. And you know what? If you're really, really disciplined with your diet and maybe you're eating like extremely high amounts of protein, Oh, maybe but i, I yeah, can't and, see it ever happening like very on point with training sleep food timing stress everything else yeah i think it's that whole like similar that, i'm not sure what your thoughts are on it like the the recomposition talk that a lot of people mm-hmm. have you know when you're like let's lose body fat and put on muscle and it's like mm-hmm. yeah like i'm sure like in theory yeah it works out well like yeah but it's such a specific type of environment mm-hmm. you've got to be in and then mm-hmm. to get someone to do it, it's almost like on the borderline of you've got to be pretty psychotic to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're always going to be best off in a slight energy surplus in order to, to build muscle. Yeah, yeah, agreed. All right, very last one for the day. This is a cool one, actually. This one, I actually, I got asked this a lot. It must have been when a documentary or something came. So I went through a stage <laughs> in my career where I always got asked this question. I know what's coming. <laughs> too much soy is bad for you, true or false? Look, I'm going to start off with saying too much of anything is bad for us. Too much oxygen is bad for us. Too much sunlight <laughs> is bad for us. Too much water is bad for us. Soy in itself is not a bad thing. And, you know, it's it's one of the most well-researched foods, I want to say, out there um, in terms of soy and its effect on our, our health and our hormones, especially because that's, you know, one of the biggest myths and the research has been done to to check that out does soy affect our hormones in a negative way and soy is actually one of the foods which has the most evidence for preventing risk of for example breast cancer or breast cancer reoccurrence it um, reduces our risk of heart disease um, ovarian cancer even prostate cancer and other hormonal conditions so soy is actually incredibly beneficial for our health it's a fantastic source of protein um, and it does not cause you know increased levels of estrogen or reduced levels of testosterone in males or man boobs or messing with hormones or any of that kind of stuff those are all complete myths and have no evidence to back them up frankly there is one case study to my knowledge where a guy was eating like a ridiculous amount of soy I'm talking like 20 plus serves per day where he experienced some unfavorable effects as a result of that but look, that's a ridiculous amount. And I'm sure you'd get some ill health effects if you were to have that amount of any food. So we know from the evidence, like two to four serves of soy per day is completely fine and potentially even beneficial to our health. Actually, yeah. definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> if you guys are interested in this and you want to like see the science that Nina's talking about it, there's an excellent talk that I always refer people to by Dr. Christopher Gardner. He's a PhD uh, nutrition researcher from Stanford University. If you go to YouTube and type in an overview of science of nutrition, one of the examples that he talks about when he talks about how hard it is to study nutrition and then make claims from the study that you do, he talks about how soy got such a bad name. And he yep. talks about comparing the Jap- these different Japanese societies and different um, study groups and how soy showed such a beneficial relationship with that. And then when you look at that in the Western world, that's when it was like, okay, they, they confabulated this data and somehow came out that soy was bad in a Western yep. diet that, you know, we all know how good a Western diet is, dot, 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 not. So it's like, this is, it's a great talk that he goes over all of this. And I recommend it to every person. If you are even remotely interested in nutrition an overview of science of nutrition by Dr. Christopher Gardner. Cool. I think, that was right. I think that's busted. Put it to the side. I think that's how many is that? Three, six, nine, 11 myths busted. So Nina, I think we should make this a regular thing. I, I, I like this. I like this. If you guys are listening to this and, and you want this to be a regular thing, shoot us a message and let us know. And if there's any other questions that you want busted by myself or Nina, we'll come back on. I think we do do this as a regular thing. Because you know what? 
the one thing that I have found practicing nutrition for years and years and years is that there's no shortage of myths that need busting in this field. Agree. Definitely agree. And there's almost like there's a factory farm coming out with new stuff every six <laughs> months, every three to six months that just gives us new material to bust. So I think we could probably make this a regular thing and never go out of or short of anything to talk about. Yep. Totally agree. All right, Nina, I'm going to let you get back to your afternoon, but happy Friday. And thanks so much for doing that. We'll chat to you next time. Great. Thanks so much for having me.